Hey, so this is something a little new. Today we're going to be doing some polemics. Uh, as you may be aware, a left-wing internet personality known as Vorsch recently put out a video titled Lefties Can't Play the Politics Game. If you haven't already seen his video or at least aren't familiar with Vorsch's positions around this issue, click the annotation now, give it a watch, then come back here. I'm going to assume you've watched it from here on. So there's a lot of points Vorsch makes in this video I don't necessarily disagree with. One of his main points is that intentionally withholding your vote just to make a point isn't exactly the height of political praxis, I agree. If you're in a position to do so, absolutely, go and exercise those few bourgeois democratic rights you have, vote how you think is best, then do something more important. Because your vote is far, far less important than a lot of the other stuff going on right now. In my opinion, this whole Bernie or bust versus vote blue no matter who debate is fundamentally missing the point on what leftists should really be doing at this point in time, or any point in time really. To be fair, Vorsch doesn't actually spend too much of his video talking about voting. In fact, he ends up doing something I really wish a lot more bread tuber types would do. He puts forward a political strategy. He makes assertions about what socialists need to be doing in the here and now. Unfortunately, Vorsch's ideas about how to fight fascism and win socialism have some serious problems to say the very least. So, should we go with Vorsch's advice and integrate ourselves further into the DNC and commit to running as Democrats in elections as our primary political strategy? Alternatively, should we, as our Twitter friend here suggests, move past Bernie Sanders? Or, more to the point, should we move past the Bernie Sanders strategy? Should we move past electoral projects within the DNC and focus our efforts elsewhere? That's the real question on the table here. And it's on this question that I feel the need to put forward a counter-argument. So here we go, my two cents. Let's start with Mr. Sanders, the big example Vorsch points to in order to make his argument. What's his role in all this, really? Is he like Vorsch suggests, a lone radical infiltrator of the party who's risen up the ranks as part of a deliberate optics project to put real radical revolutionary socialist politics on the table? Well, maybe. I mean, it's entirely possible that Bernie really is some kind of 700 IQ crypto communist and that infiltrating the Democratic Party, running in the 2016 and 2020 elections, and ultimately endorsing Clinton and Biden was part of some kind of master plan to create the basis for socialism in the United States. Maybe. Could very well be the case. But at the end of the day, it really wouldn't matter if that were true, because at the end of the day, what he actually accomplished is the exact same as if he really was the Sweden-style moderate social democrat he openly claims to be. The Bernie Sanders campaigns were a factor in the radicalization of a lot of people, like Vorsch points out, but those people were ultimately radicalized because they went beyond what Bernie was telling them. Not only that, to become truly radicalized, meaning to realize the necessity of getting rid of capitalism, they'd have to have outright rejected a lot of what Bernie was telling them. For instance, you can't agree with Sanders that open borders and freedom of movement is an inherently right-wing Koch brothers policy and be a radical socialist. You can't believe he was right to provide his glowing endorsement to two hawkishly imperialist presidential candidates in a row and be a radical socialist. You can't agree with his outright lie that Kamala Harris, whose appointment as Biden's running mate has been met with relief and rejoice from Wall Street, understands what it takes to stand up for working people and be a radical socialist. I'll give Bernie Sanders credit for putting the word socialism back on the table for discussion in the United States. And for running two inspiring progressive campaigns that managed to mobilize the support of swathes of working class people across the nation. But I think Vorsch needs a perspective check on exactly what Bernie and his campaigns really represented in the context of the fight for socialism. But let's move past Bernie for a minute and talk about strategy, tactics. Let's say Joe Biden wins the 2020 election. He fails to slow the spread of COVID-19, fails to address the demands of the Black Lives Matter movement. A lot of Americans are pissed. They hate Biden, they hate the establishment, their hearts and minds are wide open to a political alternative people are finally realizing the Democratic Party is fucked. And we're going to be the ones telling them to look for an answer within the Democratic Party. 
What good is it going to be having socialists inside the DNC who are paralyzed from making the arguments that need to be made, or worse, stuck providing left cover for candidates who are explicitly for the ruling class, as we see Bernie Sanders and AOC doing now? And I don't buy the whole angle that becoming Democrats in the short term is the best path to making a socialist party in the long term. The idea that Democrats would ever voluntarily do away with first-past-the-post voting or do anything else that would weaken the two-party duopoly that ensures their total control over the reformist left is completely absurd. We can't leave the question of building an independent left to some indeterminate point in the distant future. If we train leftists to be campaigners and bureaucrats for bourgeois politicians now, then that's what we'll get then. A left incapable of advancing class struggle or fighting for workers in any way that risks incurring the wrath of our new masters in the DNC. In other words, in any way that matters. I'm with Vorsch in that I think a Biden presidency would indeed put the left in a better position than another term of Trump. But if the independence and autonomy of the left to challenge the capitalist establishment is the price we have to pay for that, then I'd rather have Trump win and be opposed by an organized independent left than have Biden win and leftists be weak and in disarray from backing his campaign. We can't make the mistake of underestimating the difference a strong and organized left can make in historical moments like these. As another argument for liquidating into the DNC, Vorsch notes that fascists in the United States have successfully infiltrated the Republican Party and have had success in pushing the party to the right. Apparently, this is plenty enough evidence to suggest that the left can do the same in the Democrat Party. We need to be very clear that the far left and far right are not two sides of the same coin, and a tactic being sound for fascists does not make it sound for us. First of all, we need to remember that the Democrat and Republican parties are both sworn to uphold the capitalist system. That's why they exist. These institutions are purpose-built to grind the working class up into a fine golden powder which the ruling class can proceed to snort through a hundred dollar bill. Socialism, actual socialism, seeks to destroy that system. The purpose of fascism, on the other hand, is to uphold it at all costs. You'd have much better luck trying to get the democratic establishment to back fascism than to turn them into anything close to an actual left-wing alternative to the Republicans. And for an example of how that orientation manifests in reality, you only need to look as far as how the DNC actively prioritized getting rid of Bernie over beating Trump. The party establishment consciously decided they'd prefer another four years of Trump over the possibility of even a moderate social democratic president like Sanders coming to power. And this is really easy stuff for a lot of people to see. And it's one of the reasons why so many people are so hesitant to just hop aboard the Biden bus and back the party establishment that threw their best chance at beating Trump in the dumpster just to avoid taking a few steps to the left. Vorsch also heavily implies that getting Biden elected is necessary to spare us from some kind of dystopic fascist future under Trump. If the spectre of fascism is there, and it's growing in power and influence, an electoral defeat will not stop it. Historically speaking, this is especially true. When Adolf Hitler ran for president in the German election in 1932, he lost to a guy called Paul von Hindenburg. He got a respectable 30% of the vote, but Hindenburg beat him out at about 50%. The Vorsches of the time backed Hindenburg because although he was fairly right-wing, they believed his commitment to the status quo would drive him to block Hitler's rise to power. The German ruling class, though, they were practically crying out for fascism at this point. A bunch of prominent politicians and industrialists wrote an open letter to Hindenburg, urging him to appoint Hitler as chancellor in the new government, and that's exactly what he did. Then there was the Reichstag fire, then the Enabling Act, also signed by Hindenburg, and bingo bongo, now you have Nazi Germany. I have like a whole video about fascism and the conditions that bring it about and all that shit, so I'll just plug that up there in the corner to check out if you're so inclined. Now... Ever heard of Oswald Mosley? In a certain parallel timeline to ours, you definitely have, because he happened to be the infamous ruler of fascist Britain. But 
being one of the people who instead lives in this timeline, lucky you, you may or may not have heard of him because his organisation, the British Union of Fascists, 50,000 members strong in 1934, was definitively crushed by a confident and gargantuan anti-fascist street movement consisting of communists and socialist parties, Jewish groups, organised workers and thousands of others. That's what beats fascism. Popular power, not liberal politicians. Believe me, if we were in a historical time where full-on fascism was knocking on the door and Trump decided he needed to become Hitler, Biden would be his Hindenburg. Because while the establishment might pay lip service to anti-fascism now, when it gets to the point where they see fascism as being in their best interests, it'll be up to us to fight that battle. And if at that point we're still looking to Bidens and Hindenburgs to save us, we will end up in those mass graves Vorsch is so worried about. We can't be waiting until then to suddenly change our strategy. We need to get organised now, and in my opinion, right now that means being an active participant in the anti-fascist movement and in anti-racist and anti-capitalist movements more broadly. Vorsch says the opposition to his strategy of class collaboration and liquidationism is about looking good and not being seen to dirty your hands by working with unsavory institutions and individuals. It's about putting principles over strategy, choosing moral righteousness over victory. I'd argue that leftists maintaining their principles is a matter of strategy, and that leaving them by the wayside to throw in our lot with a ruling class party is a recipe for catastrophe. I'm serious about winning and victory too, and I believe that if we do things Vorsch's way, if we liquidate ourselves into the Democratic Party establishment and fail to argue for a true alternative to not just the Democrats, but also to the parliamentary road to socialism, we will lose. And if we want to win, we need to be making those arguments every step of the way, not just leaving them to some undefined point in the future where we'll finally change our orientation to encouraging workers to fight for ourselves rather than rely on capitalist politicians to fight our battles for us. We're not fascists. We don't benefit from keeping our aims and ideas hidden to try and make inroads in capitalist institutions. Fascism is compatible with capitalism. It's compatible with those institutions. We're not. We can't transform them in our image, and we shouldn't focus our efforts on trying to. There's an alternative to Vorsch's strategy, and that's organising actual, independent, and explicitly revolutionary socialist organisations. That's not to say we can't engage in broader projects to grow our platform. We should, as a matter of fact, do that. Do whatever it takes to win over more and more disaffected people to our ideas. But when shit's really fucking going down, we can't be the ones trying to convince them that the Democratic Party is our pathway to the solution. Because even if we can get them to buy into our bullshit, we'll be setting them up for failure when victory is the most important. If you're still not convinced of what I'm trying to get across here, there's a really great article I came across in my reading for this video from the revolutionary socialist publication Tempest, aptly titled The Lesser Evil Trap. I think it applies really well to this debate and provides really good counters to a lot of the common arguments used by people who mirror Vorsch's position. If you're living in the United States and you want a sharp, clear resource for socialist organizing strategy in the here and now, you need to check out this website. I think it's a fantastic development for the American left that this exists and it's very necessary in the face of all these other arguments that keep coming up. So. I'll put the links to the Lesser Evil Trap article and to Tempest itself down in the description. There's also another video I should mention that Vorsch put out as I was working on this response titled Would Marx, Engels, Lenin, etc. have supported Biden? To answer that question, I would say nine, nine, and net. <laughs> I think you can guess how I'd answer that question. But... Thankfully, another YouTuber called Bad Empanada has beaten me to the punch on that and saved me the trouble, so click the annotation and give that a watch if you're so inclined. And that's all I've got. I've still got my proper full video on the politics of Half-Life coming soon, so if this is your first exposure to me and my channel and you like the cut of this young rabble rousers jib, feel free to subscribe and catch that when it comes out. I will in fact be briefly exploring the failure of reformism in that video too, uh, specifically in Chile, and 
Now you're probably wondering what Chilean reformism has to do with Half-Life, to which I say, guess you'll just have to subscribe and find out, huh? Hey, just because I care about the victory of socialism doesn't mean I can't harvest a bit of clout while I'm at it. Adios.